This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hello everybody, I'm Nick and I'm going to show you five more c -sharp keywords that you probably never had to use. And I do say probably because a month ago I did a very similar video talking about six keywords you never had to use in c -sharp. And it turns out there are some niche communities and some niche use cases that actually do use the keywords I showed on that video. So if you're using any of the keywords I'm going to show in this video, please leave a comment down below letting me know where you use them and how and why because I'm very interested. So without any further ado, let's go straight into the code. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and the same notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So, the first keyword I want to show you is actually a combination of two keywords and it is the extern alias combination. Now, what do I have here? I have a main a, a method in the program.cs and I have a person1 and person2. Now, let's say I actually want to JSON serialize those with two different versions of the same library. Let's say we have the JSON.NET library for version 12 and version 13. There might be some reason that I need to do this and I need to do it somehow. Now, if I go to NuGet and try to do this, I'm not allowed to actually have both versions. So instead, I actually downloaded the DLLs and I'm gonna add them as references via the DLL. So I'm gonna go to dependencies, add reference and click the add from button. I'm gonna select both and add them, which means I can now go here and save our person one as text equals json uh, convert dot oh i need to import it let's try to import this oh nothing happened why is nothing happening well nothing is happening because i'm using the same fully qualified name in two packages both this and this on a namespace level if i go to the assembly viewer are both newtonsoft.json the only thing that changes is the version so how do i explicitly reference one version and the other. Well, I can do this using aliases for the libraries. So if I go in writer and properties, I can scroll down here and find the, wait, not here. That's my bad. Uh, I go here, assemblies and here. And then I find the aliases section. And which version is this? This is the 12.0. So I'm gonna say JSON all here. And I'm going to find the other one, which is the new, and I'm going to say JSON new. And now what I'm able to do is go up here and say extern alias. And I'm using the name and the name is actually stored in the CS prod. So I can see what alias I've given to every library. So let's say I want to use the old version. I'm going to use the alias JSON old. And now since I have this here, I can say JSON convert dot deserialize object or actually serialize object uh, of our person one as text equals that. And I'm gonna say person one. Now, how do I refer to the second one without having a conflict? Well, there's a couple of ways. Again, I'm gonna change this to JSON new. So that's the alias of the 13.0 version. And this doesn't break anything because I'm not actually uh, using the using statement yet for that. What you can do is you can say JSON convert v12 here equals this. Uh, and I'm going to do a, a JSON convert here as well. Here we go. And now I can replace that. And now I can do this. Or you could simply just import the namespace using that syntax. Uh, but if you want to use a specific method uh, or class, you can actually simply do this. And then I'll change this to JSON new similar thing and then let's say i want to serialize person 2 with a different version so uh person 2 as text equals json convert v13 does serialize object person 2 and now i'm able to do this for person 1 and person 2 using different versions of the same fully qualified name library uh, in my project now why you don't see this combination well probably because you're using nuget and nuget doesn't really allow you to do that but even if it did the value of having two different versions of the same library uh, is questionable at best because of all the conflicts that you have so probably that's why you don't see it because you don't really need to refer to two different versions of the same library however if you're using it please leave a comment down below let me know how you're using it the next keyword is the go to keyword now you might not know this i've talked about it in a different video but in case you don't know c sharp actually has labels and the go to statement and let's see an example here we have a set of characters in a stack and then we're popping that stack into a string and we're writing down the name uh, that was popped so if i run this 
you should see in the debugger the name is Nick because the stack will pop basically from the top. And this while loop can actually be rewritten like this. You can say if character has any or characters have any, then pop. Obviously, if I run it like this, you will only see uh, K, sorry, N. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to have a label. So we're going to label this start. And the syntax is basically the name of the label and a colon. And then you can say go to and then label name. And now if I run this again, you see the name because if I'm going to, uh, to debug it, let me just step through the code and show you how it works. Making this smaller labels here four characters popping and goes back to the beginning here we go go to and then at the end now why you don't use the go to well that's one that you might be using i know some people use it when you have nested um, loops to break out of the loop without double breaking i would personally refactor those loops to be individual um loops instead of a nested one but that's a use case that i've seen it I don't really see the value in it basically because of control flow and how everything works in C sharp. It doesn't really fit in that aesthetic. I can see it being used, you know, in C all the time, but go to is just not something you would use in C sharp. So that's, I think, why it's not so prominent. But it is supported, and I, I'm personally using it when I'm doing some hacky things and I want to break to different places. Never in production code, never in something that other people will use. I've said how I don't think that this keyword should be used in C-Shop, but it's there. Before I move forward, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions of people like you and me come together to take the learning experience to the next level. As someone who has solely focused on sharpening their backend software engineering skills over the years, I feel that my front-end skills and anything related to web design is holding me back from creating my own full-stack projects. Skillshare has thousands of classes on web development, web design, and UX for all skill levels, so you can rest assured that you will definitely find something to learn from. I personally had an interest in learning more about user experience and taking Marik Makowski's intro to UX Fundamentals of Usability was an eye-opening experience for something I used to take for granted. With an annual subscription that is less than $10 a month, you gain access to thousands of ad-free classes curated specifically for learning, with new premium classes launching all the time. The first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So take the next step in your creative journey and click that link in the description for your free trial. Now the fourth keyword is the global keyword. Let's see an example here and see how that works. I have program.cs here and it is in this namespace. It's in a folder called system. And then in that same namespace, I have a class called console and it has some help text. Now, as part of my main program, I want to write something to the console. So I will simply do console. Uh, oh, I can't do that because the namespace is scoped to this class so it won't really allow me to go to the right line right i cannot just do this and say hey um some text because it's looking in here and that's why it's lighting up so how can i access the global namespace well you can access the global namespace by doing global double colon and then the namespace so system dot um, console.writeline and that's basically what the global uh, keyword does it allows you to access the global namespace no matter where you are now this is the keyword that I've seen the most but I've seen it used in things like auto-generated code or I think AWS when you create a lambda needs you to have something that is using global I think but I never had to really use it because not only you have to use something system which means you hate people but in that same folder you have to add something called console which means you really hate people so it's very unlikely that the naming will align in a way that pre will prevent you from using for example a using statement let's say using um, console equals something something um, which would allow you to get around that problem but it's very unlikely that it will happen and 
that's why I haven't really seen it everywhere apart from auto-generated code, which ensures that you always access the global uh, namespace. Now, the last one is the volatile keyword. Now, full disclaimer, the volatile keyword is probably a topic on its own. In fact, this is the second time I'm recording this video. The first time I actually went way too deep and this video ended up being 35 minutes long just because I was talking for volatile. Uh, I might just put a clip here showing you how deep I went. I was actually inspecting uh, JIT assembler and you can see how without volatile here, we have a move of zero extend and a logical compare. Uh, while if I do add the volatile back in, uh, the code of the request of doesn't change, it's still a move. But instead, here we have a compare to operant instruction, and there's also a small change that happened here as well. But yeah, here I'm going to show you, like, in a very surface level, how it works and tell you why I don't think it's being used anymore. So, what I have here is a main program that creates a work class, an instance of it, which is this class here, which has this field called should stop, which, as long as this field is false, uh, it will continue going and going and going and at the end it's terminating and i have a request stop method here which if you call it it will set it to true and cause this loop to you know go out of the loop and say uh, work a thread terminating gracefully and i have the volatile boolean uh, the volatile keyword here now here's how the main code is looking i'm creating a new thread and i'm putting the do work method in that thread parallel to the main thread i'm showing and the do work is actually that iteration that's happening in the background uh, and then I'm starting the thread, I'm waiting for it to be alive, and then once it's started, I'm waiting for half a second, and I'm using the request stop method, which is the one that's setting this volatile boolean to true. And then once it's stopped, we're doing a join to wait for that thread to actually uh, complete before we terminate the program, and then we say terminated. I'm going to remove this um, volatile boolean and show you something. I'm going to set my uh, running to debug, and I'm going to debug the code and execute it and show you how execution works. This is not the right project. This is the right project. So let me try it again. So this is how you would expect the code to behave, right? We have the program starting, saying that the worker thread started, waiting for a bit, then doing request stop and popping out of the loops, saying terminated gracefully, and then that the worker thread has terminated. Now this is in debug mode without the volatile boolean on this field. We're gonna change this to release and run instead, not debug. And as you can see, the program hangs. It doesn't, it won't move forward. No matter how much I wait, it just won't move forward. And if I stop this, I am going now to add the volatile keyword here. And I'm going to run it again in release mode, running it. And this time it terminated. So why is this happening? Well, if you want to know why this is happening, please leave a comment asking for that video just to go fully technical on that and just nerd out. I won't explain exactly why it's happening like with very accurate technical terms and assembler steps and optimizations. But basically there's two things. First, why is this working without volatile on debug mode, but it doesn't work on release mode? Well, the compiler, in both the compilation, but also the runtime, when you use a JIT compiler to optimize the code further, we'll try to optimize this. But optimizing code and execution of code and having things like memory in the mix and also manipulation of properties by multiple threads and accessing them by multiple threads, you can get in a situation where the optimization that the compiler did is actually harming the execution of the sequence of events that happened. Now, the reason why this is not happening in debug mode, but it's happening on release mode, is because the code is optimized differently, both on the IL level and also in the JIT assembler level, when the code is built in debug mode and release. Because in debug, you actually have underperforming code because you have more steps to enable you to debug more efficiently. But when you release, the compiler will go crazy and optimize a lot of things and try to get your code to run as fast as possible. But in this specific scenario, it's harming the way that the software is running. However, if I add the volatile keyword, I will actually hint to the compiler that, hey, those optimizations that you're doing to make this super fast, don't do them for this specific field and everything involved with that field because we might break something. That's the basic idea. Now, I don't want to talk about very specific memory accessing things and manipulation uh, because I can talk for hours, but this is basically why I would use it. Now, why haven't I seen this keyword? Well, I started coding .NET 
in an environment where the applications were more asynchronous rather than multi-threaded. So I didn't have to deal, and I haven't really seen any projects that heavily deal with uh, multi-threading. And even when they do, they try to keep each thread to have its own state so it doesn't actually cross any boundaries and manipulate something that it shouldn't. And even when it does, it usually uses you know, locks and semaphores um, to do that. So using the Voltal keyword, definitely has a place it's just that i never had to use it or i've never seen it being used so that's the last one in the list that's all i have for you for this video thank you very much for watching special thanks to my patreons for making these videos possible if you want to support me as well you can find the link in the description down below leave a like if you like this video subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well and i'll see you in the next video keep coding